uh, that we will have a written exam at the end of this lecture term yeah? because we will have like 100 participants. But we want to do this very gentle. Yeah? So what we will do is in order not to make things too bad, we want to have at least one practice exam. So you will get access in, in the, towards the end of the exercises. We will have one complete exam that will be like the written exam, but of course not identical, but very much like the written exam. And we will prepare them just for preparation. So in other lectures, you have the benefit that you can already go back to a whole bunch of uh, written examinations in order to prepare for the exam. You don't have this for this examination, which is why we will do that and we will make it, we will make it gentle, okay? Um, good, then there's a couple of more uh, announcements. Actually, this lecture should be recorded, but uh, I don't see anybody recording here right now. Uh, Maybe the next, it's, it's not too bad, because today we will only do the introduction. Um, we will, are you recording this lecture? <laughs> okay, so at least I have the promise uh, by the Rechenzentrum that they will record the lecture. Uh, hopefully starting from next week. There won't be a lecture on this Thursday. So this Thursday, I have to do a business trip. So I won't be here, so there won't be a lecture. So next lecture will be on April 19th, which is uh, next Tuesday. So same time as today, same room. By the way, the Thursday's uh, lecture. Hi. Ooh. OK, this means I have to start over and tell everything again. But now at least half of you is already shocked, and I only have to shock the other half. <clears throat> Good. So a lecture. I want to start the lecture at 4 sharp, uh, because this is, is that a, a big problem if you start exactly at 4? Are there, uh, because then we can finish at, uh, 5.30, because that's already pretty late. And if you want to get home, uh, then you probably want to leave here at uh, 5.30 and not uh, stay until 6. Good. So hopefully we'll, we'll have recordings uh, at some point. Um, I don't know what happened, but the Rechenzentrum actually was informed. And yeah, we're skipping lecture this first day. So next lecture will be on April 19th. You, and the big news is we will have a written exam because there's now some, so th this lecture used to have like 30 people, 20 to 30 people, and we could do all the exams orally. But now we have uh, almost 100 people attending this lecture. This is uh, pretty, pretty crazy. And actually only half of you are actually attending the lecture and the rest of you is uh, actually watching recordings. So about half of the people don't even show up in the lecture and just watch the recordings, which is perfectly fine. Nonetheless, with so many participants, we have to go towards a written exam. We will make it gentle and uh, we will prepare a test examination that will be very much like the real exam towards the end of the semester. So in the, in the last um, uh, week or in the last two weeks of the semester, we will have this test written exam. And you will see that the, the structure of the written exam that we put in the last week uh, will be very similar to what you've seen uh, here in the lecture. So one part will be, will be consisting of theory. So you will um, have to reproduce things that we talked about here in the lecture. And um, another part will be uh, a bit of um, calculation, uh, so that you have to calculate something on paper. And this will be more or less it. 60 minutes, uh, probably four, four different uh, exercise tasks to solve in the examination, and each 15 minutes. So for every minute, one point. And if you have um, 30 points, uh, you should be able to pass the exam. 
Okay, good. So this is the big news. Are there any questions so far? Then uh, I would like to introduce uh, Leonard Husvogt. Uh, he will be doing the exercises. You may already know him. Do you want to say something? <laughs> not, not, he's a shy guy. Yeah. So we will actually double up um, the exercises as we did in DMIP. So previously we had like um, two instances of the exercises and we will double up to four again because I, will ex I expect that quite a few people will go to the exercises. And as in DMIP last semester, uh, you can do the written exam uh, for five ECTS and if you pass 50% of the exercise problems, you can qualify for the 7.5 ECTS version. Okay. Good. So, yes? No, there's no other exam. There's only one written exam. There won't be two versions of the written exam. And the exercises you just have to show to the tutor. So you implement them and on the guidance of the tutor and then you just show it. So. I think it's a, it's a fairly easy way to do the uh, 2.5 ECTS. Okay, good. More questions? Yes, please. Are there four hours of lecture or only So I want to do four hours because I will have to skip one lecture on occasion. So I can already tell you there will be occasional business trips. So we will do four hours, and I hopefully we can finish early. Yeah? So I think that the last maybe two weeks of the semester we will finish early, and then you have more time to prepare for the written exam. Exactly. Okay. More questions? Ah, no. <laughs> See, it, it took some time until you felt com comfortable, you know. Do you want to have the microphone? I think it's okay. You can all understand me, yes. So, in order uh, to take part in the exercises, you don't want to take the exercise, you don't want to take on two long, and join one of the four exercise uh, sessions. So, there are four groups in two long, you join one of them, uh, one for Mondays, one for Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and so on. Uh, you just join one, that's the, the exercise session in which you take part in. And Yes, please. Uh, there are four sessions available of four exercises. Right. How many groups are you One. So, uh, again, we, in the last um, semester, we had around 50 or 60 people attending actually the exercises, and we want to keep the exercise groups small that you can actually ask questions, and we don't want to have it too crowded. Yes? There will be four repetitions of the introduction to Python. Uh, right, yeah. So, so if, if you want to hear it twice or three times, you can hear it up to four times. <laughs> yes? No, unfortunately not. So um, we, have to fix, we still have to fix the date. But uh, what, what is your opinion? I think it would be good to have it very early. Um, after the lecture term because we will have some extra time to prepare. So it would be good maybe, so let me, uh, so early August, would that be good? Or, or even earlier? So, 
Yeah, so we could do also like mid of July, something like uh, July 20th. Then I would try to get a date around July 18 to 24 or something. This would be the first week. Okay, more remarks? Yes, I'm, I'm aware that I'm bringing very sad news with the written exam. Uh, this, is, this is also hard for me. Huh? But I'm trying to make it very gentle, okay? I, I promise that I will make a very gentle written exam and we will have the test exam previously. More comments? Other than we hate you because you <laughs> do a written exam? Okay, good. Um, yes? No, you weren't asking a question. You were asking a question. Oh, that's actually an excellent question uh, because <laughs> it's already on slide two here. <laughs> so, uh, first question usually is, can we shift the time for the lecture? And the answer is no, we can't. But it's going to be recorded, uh, hopefully, if anybody from the Rechenzentrum shows up. Or maybe they're already recording by this camera and I'm not aware of it. And now all my complaining about not being recorded has been recorded. Um, anyway, so... There will be recordings. Next question is, is diagnostic medical image processing required to ad attend IMIP? And the answer is, um, well, if you are highly motivated, uh, you should be able to follow the contents. And what we are doing is we are putting in refresher courses. So there's a couple of topics that are already part of DMIP, but we are repeating them in the beginning of the lecture. And actually, we will start with repeating already today. So if you have attended DMIP, then you can leave in the second part uh, of this lecture because you already know about uh, singular value decomposition, which we will talk about today. Um, do I need to know Python? Um, actually, there's um, a refresher course or an introduction to Python that should actually help you. And one reason why we went away from MATLAB is, um, to be honest, uh, MATLAB costs uh, a lot of money and uh, the license fees uh, actually take up about half of the software license budget of our lab. So this is really expensive. And uh, to be more honest, it, uh, the MATLAB licenses consume up a quarter of the entire budget of the lab. Uh, so, not, not including third-party funding, but the, the budget that you typically have, the household uh, on, on a computer science um, lab uh, is consumed to by 25% by MATLAB licenses. So, instead that we get money from MathWorks uh, for teaching people how to use their software, they're taking money from us, and I think this is... Uh, it's not a very good deal, so we decided to move on to Python, and you will realize that it's quite similar. Do you want to uh, comment on Python? So Leonard uh, had the excellent task of moving everything from MATLAB to Python, um, and I'm very thankful for this. You're saving us a lot of money. <laughs> Any comments on Python? Okay, so that's the other big news. Uh, we are going to Python this uh, semester. Okay, uh, is it uh, required to solve the exercise problem? Uh, well, this actually boils down to this question. If you solve the exercise problems, uh, then you can get uh, another 2.5 ECTS. That's, uh, that's the only thing. But uh, actually, we made those exercise problems not just for fun, but um, they will be... Uh, they will be pretty interesting, and on the other hand, they will, they will be also relevant for the written exam. So yeah, if you go to the exercises, you might realize that uh, some of the exercise problems, not all of them, but some of the exercise problems will be quite similar to um, some questions that you will ex encounter in the written exam. Okay, is there a book that covers the lecture? Um, and there is none. Unfortunately, there's no book. Um, and 
Yeah, I don't think that there will be a book. Yes. Uh, is there a written exam different if you're taking five CPS or ten point five hours? No, no difference. No difference in the written exam. Yeah, it's only that you completed the exercise problem. Yeah. So sounds like a good deal, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. So uh, another thing that. Uh, I hope I can motivate you for is um, IMIP is very close to the stuff, uh, the kind of research that we are doing in the lab. So if you have fun in this lecture, you may also want to consider if you want to do a, a bachelor's or master's thesis with us. And the, the stuff that you're learning here in the lecture is really close to the things that we apply in research. And it's a very good preparation for doing research projects with us. Technically, um, we also supply topics for bachelor's and master's thesis on our website, but most of the time we create them very individually. So if you're interested in doing a thesis with us, just let me know, send me an email, and we'll find a suitable topic for you. So every, essentially every topic for a, um, for a bachelor's or master's thesis is assigned only to a single student, and we're creating them very individually. You can give feedback to the lecture anytime you want. So you can send me an email. And maybe you already did that, writing me that you don't want to have a written exam or something like this. <laughs> so you can give feedback at any time. And if you do that, then uh, please directly write to me. And if there is something I can do about it, I try to do that as soon as possible. So last semester we had the case that the exercise groups were way too big and two weeks after that we had increased the number of exercises by a factor of two. So this is something that we could do easily. So if you complain, we try to comply as good as possible. And of course there will be an evaluation and of course you can use that. But the bad thing with the evaluation is if you wait for the evaluation forms, then the evaluation result will come out at the end of the semester. So this will help to improve the class for students in the next years, but this doesn't help you. And if you have a concrete, uh, a direct problem that you want to have fixed, then please send the feedback right away. Yeah? Good. So no book, master's thesis, bachelor's thesis, and feedback on the lecture. Good. So what will be the topics? So we will be doing, in this semester, interventional medical image processing. And there's quite a bit of contrast to diagnostic medical image processing, because in diagnostics, you typically have time. So the patient comes in, and what you want to do is you want to do a diagnosis. So you want to be very sure about the decision you're going to make. And this decision will be very relevant for the subsequent treatment. In interventional medical image processing, we are doing the treatment. So the patient is on the table. So we will focus very much on methods that will be very efficient and that can be employed in an interventional setting. So this is directly in the intervention. And you will real and then we have to be very quick with the processing. The main topics will be image pre-processing and image enhancement. So we also need, of course, image preprocessing in the interventional application. And we will have a couple of algorithms that will start from edge detection. We will do a bit of vesselness and uh, do extract low-level features from the images. And this will be followed by image enhancement. We will talk about uh, guided filter, bilateral filter, edge-preserving filtering. And we will have a short excursion to image super-resolution. Then in the next part, we will talk essentially about image information extraction. So we want to support the interventionalist. So we want to detect devices, structures in the image. We want to probably reconstruct. So if you have two images of the same scene, you are able to reconstruct a 3D information. And we can use that to support the intervention. Then the next thing that we're going to do is we will talk a bit about segmentation. So segmenting structures, 
with fast and efficient algorithms and also with model-based algorithms. So if you have, uh, sometimes you have a pretty bad image quality in the interventional setting because you want to make, uh, you want to save those. So typically, in a, for example, in an X-ray system, you can do uh, up to uh, 30 frames a second. Maybe um, for many reasons, people only use a much lower frame rate, so they only use maybe five frames a second because this is enough to guide the intervention. And of course, with every X-ray projection, you, uh, you have additional dose to the patient. So you want to save dose, so you use lower frame rates. And of course, you use small doses and you get very noisy images. So noise will be quite a problem in the interventional image processing. Then one thing that is also very important is non-rigid image registration. So you have a prior scan of the patient. Patient comes uh, and lies down on the table. And uh, for example, in the abdomen, everything moves around. And you will have to deform the prior volume to match the current situation of your patient. So this is non-rigid image registration. And in the last part, we will look into interventional reconstruction. And this will mainly focus on reconstruction of the beating heart and what we can do to actually be able to reconstruct. And we will use some of the ideas that we previously learned in DMIP on image reconstruction. Okay. So on the other hand, uh, we will also need a couple of tools. So this lecture will also introduce a couple of mathematical tools. We will start today with linear algebra. Then we will talk about differentiation because this is very differentiation and also filtering because that's very important for edge detection and for many image uh, interpretation or low level feature extraction, you need um, filtering. We will look a bit into um, local and global optimization. Also convex optimization will be a very slight topic. We will not go too, into too much detail. Then we will introduce variational calculus. You will find that variational calculus is a very nice tool uh, that you can use to optimize uh, functionals. And we will look a bit into partial differential equations. Good, so in image preprocessing, I think I already said that, we do edge detection, uh, half transformation, structured tensor, vesselness filter. Then in the image enhancement, we will do a bit of filtering. We will look into the uh, joint bilateral filtering, guided filter, and super resolution. And in image information extraction, we will use epipolar geometry to reconstruct uh, like 3D points. We will shortly look also into consistency because this is a, a very nice concept actually for X-ray projections. You can use consistency essentially as a checksum. So every pair of X-ray projections, if they're calibrated, they come with a kind of checksum that is quite useful if you want to figure out if there's uh, if something happened in between. This is a very nice concept. Then we will talk a bit about structure from motion. So if you have a tracking sequence of points and you track all the points over a, a certain sequence, then you are able to independently reconstruct the set of points and the camera pose parameters. This is also a very nice idea. Then we will localize organs and we will talk a bit about segmentation using random box. And for a model-based segmentation approach, we will look into active shape models. One topic for pre-processing or for, for extraction is, for example, a shutter detection. And here you see a typical radiography image. And here you see an X-ray tube and a detector on the other side. And then you can see that uh, this is actually a quite good idea. So for patient positioning, you are using light to see which area of the patient will be illuminated. And here, before you do it, the actual x-ray projection, you emit visible light for positioning. And then this area will be uh, collected if you uh, shoot x-rays out here. And a very typical problem is that you want to detect the shutters. So this is a system where you can place the detector independently 
of the tube. So here you place your detector, and what may happen is that the detector is rotated at some angle, and what you want to get is automatically the right orientation of the image. So you need to detect the boundaries, and this can be done very efficiently, for example, with the half transform. And for, of course, this is not the only kind of shutter that can appear. For example, and geography systems are also equipped with different shutters. And here we have a shutter that is not uh, completely opaque, but you can actually uh, see through it. And these are typically wedge filters. So they are small wedges made of aluminum. Yeah? So if you look at the profile, they look like this. Uh, and then you have your image here, and you move them into the image. And you can see the slight ramp here, that they get more absorbing towards the outside of the image. And you can move in those kind of uh, wedge filters. These are, of course, on the tube side. So all the x-rays have to pass through here before they hit the patient. And you can use that, for example, to, re to re reduce the dose burden for the patient. And of course, you can control the illumination of the image. So here in this case, you have a lot of direct radiation here, and you can put in this wedge filter to reduce the amount of direct radiation to the detector. And then you have an image that um, does not have so, uh, so a high dynamic range. Here you can see a combination of the two. So here you have uh, a shutter that is uh, completely opaque, so here you can't see anything. And then you have an, addition, an additional shutter that is moved into here, that is uh, this kind of wedge filter. Like um, Typically, these complete shutters, uh, they have something like two millimeters of lead. So two millimeters of lead is enough to block the direct uh, X-ray beam. And this will com uh, absorb completely. So there's no illumination past two millimeters of lead. And then you have those uh, probably aluminum uh, wedge filters that you can use to additionally control the image. And again, here you want to detect the edges in the image. And of course, you want to detect this edge on the outside, but not the edge of the additional shutter. Yeah. So you have to think about how you can actually design an algorithm that gets the right edge. Another thing that is very, very useful for intervention are guidance systems. And this is a very cool device. So this is a magnetic a catheter navigation system. What you can see here, this is an, a C-arm system. So this has a small detector, flat panel. Why are we using a flat panel detector? Well, we have a huge magnet here. This is a magnet that can re uh, induce a huge magnetic field. And if you attended uh, DMIP, you know why we are using a flat panel here. And we are not using an image intensifier because the image intensifier won't work in such a high magnetic field. But the cool thing is now you have this X-ray source down here, and you have the flat panel imager up here. And now you put a patient on the table, and you go in with your catheter. And then you may encounter, or you will most likely encounter, the situation that you have a blood vessel, and the blood vessel branches. And let's say it branches in such a way that you want to go up here. So this is your patient on the table. So this is all inside the patient. And then you do your x-ray guidance. And you put your catheter in. You typically, you, you go in with, a, with this metal catheter uh, in here. And then you push it all the way up. And at this point, you want to go this way. Yeah. And what you need to do then is you need actually a lot of skill. So this is a, essentially a wire. And it's really hard to control the wire in such a way that it jumps into this branch. Because all you can do with this wire is essentially push and rotate. So you can twist it a little. So you need a lot of skill to make a jump in here. So what you typically need to do is you have to twist it such that it lies in such a position, and then you are able to push it up here. Huh? So this is how you make the catheter go in here. So this is really difficult. And of course, these are, these are vessels. Yeah? There's blood flowing in here. And if you start hurting the vessel wall, and if you, uh, if you have a puncture here, then blood will uh, flow out. So you don't want to punch, uh, puncture uh, the vein that you're in. 
So you don't want to puncture the vessel, and you want to very safely guide your catheter through here. And the nice idea that the guys the, that developed this device had, they have a, a small magnet on the tip of the catheter. And then the system is calibrated. So they reconstruct the 3D position of the catheter. And then using the, so with this magnet also you can rotate, right? So using the magnet, you can then uh, induce a magnetic force that will push your catheter into the right uh, vessel. So you need a reconstruction of the vasculature, and you need uh, a catheter that has a magnet in, at the tip. And then you can use such a system to have a kind of, not just a GPS, but also something like a lane assist that will really help you to get into the right vessel branch. Well, you have to calibrate it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course, of course, yes. But um, this can really help uh, if you want to do uh, minimal invasive surgery. Yeah, if your system is off, if your system is calibrated off by a centimeter and you start pushing here, it's not a good idea, yeah. So this is also something that you will learn here in the lecture, how to calibrate systems and how to reconstruct 3D points and point correspondences in order to be able to do such a fusion. And of course, there's also a lot of computer graphics involved here, because what you also need is some kind of, uh, so you need the 2D image, or the X-ray projection, but typically you don't see the vessel. So this vessel is filled with blood, and blood has about the uh, absorption of water. And this is embedded in soft tissue, which has about the absorption of water. So if you do an X-ray projection of this, you will see nothing. But in order to make it visible, you have to intra inject contrast agent. So this is iodine-based, and you do uh, inject a bit of contrast agent, and the contrast agent will follow the blood flow, and then you can see actually where this vessel is. So what you do is you do an overlay. So you do a segmentation in 3D, and you register your prior, uh, prior, uh, your prior volume with the current patient position. And after you did that, you inject, so you inject contrast agent once that you can see the vessels. You do a 3D scan. And then you can do an overlay. So you're actually using the prior volume to overlay the current scene. Which is also nice because then you can always see the vessel boundaries without having to inject contrast agent. But that's uh, actually only half of the story because what happens, these vessels... They, they, are, they are flexible. And then you start pushing in your catheter here, and there is a, the catheter is quite stiff. So what will happen is that the catheter will, uh, first of all, it will be on the vessel boundary, and it will apply force. And in some vessels, it may occur that you actually uh, change the location of the vessel because your catheter is very stiff, and it will move the vessel. And we won't talk about... Um, this in detail, but then again, you need um, registration approaches to deform your vessel mesh such that it actually matches the current catheter position. So as soon as you start uh, going down this direction, then you have to model more and more in order to be able to provide very accurate imaging. Uh, but this is not the case for all the vessels. Yeah, some, some of the vessels also have to pass bones and so on, and they won't be deformed that much. Good. And of course, you, can, you have the imaging, so you can update. So you can, you can always inject that little contrast agent and see the current situation of the vessel. Another very nice machine, which is also um, in relevant for minimally invasive surgery, is uh, such a navigation system. And what this system does, it, it has essentially two cameras. So you can see that... This system has an infrared camera here and infrared camera here, and it emits infrared light. And now you have two small markers on the instrument, and those two markers reflect the infrared light. So in the infrared camera, you will see two bright spots. Now you track those two points from two cameras, and then you are able to reconstruct the 3D position of the device. At the same time, you co-register this to 
a preoperative CT scan. And what you can do then is you can visualize the current position inside the body of the tip of your instrument in real time. So you can move this freely. It's being tracked by the system here. And in real time, you can follow the position of the tip. And this is, for example, used in neurosurgery. So you do a rigid registration of the skull of a prior volume. Then you open the skull, and then you can see what uh, kind of structure you're pointing at. So this is also a very interesting uh, device, and we will look into the theory how to build such devices in this lecture. So this is also interventional and also very quick. Then a very interesting topic, or very relevant in this topic, will be non-rigid image registration. One thing that you can do, for example, is digital subtraction and geography. So for the dig digital subtraction and geography, you do two images. You take one image with, without contrast agent and one with contrast agent, and then you subtract the two, and this shows you only the contrast agent. But typically, your patient breathes in between. So what you need to do is you need to do an image warping of the mask and the fill image and then subtract the two. So you typically use non-rigid image registration in between. Uh, one of the products in the market is called a flexible pixel shift, but it's actually a non-rigid image registration. We will look into monomodal image registration following a variational approach where we'll use a variational calculus. And we will also look into very shortly into using geometric dis uh, constraints and also prior knowledge. Uh, if you know that there is a bone and the bone can't deform, then you can model that actually that there, you don't permit any deformation in the bone. Then we will also look into interventional reconstruction. So one thing there will be free ultrasound reconstruction and factorization. And um, another topic we will look at is e ECG gating. So how can you reconstruct the beating heart in an interventional scanner? So in contrast to the, to the diagnostic scanners, in the diagnostic scanners you can rotate the gantry up to four times a second, which is fast enough that you can actually reconstruct the heart within 60 milliseconds. But on the interventional scanner, do you remember this C arm? Can you see? Yeah, so this is the C-arm system. You see this device here? So this is open, but it's essentially also a CT uh, gantry as soon as you rotate it. And you have the X-ray source and the detector here. And now you start rotating, and you want to rotate at least, let's say, 200 degrees. But this is in the interventional room, so it, what it will, it will do, it will rotate like this, right? And then if you think of a typical intervention room, uh, there's a lot of stuff around. So there's many, many devices in there. And if you, first of all, you have to do a test run and see if you can do the motion without collision. And second, um, you can't move too quickly because if there's somebody in the way and you do it very fast, you know, so if you rotate in one second the entire 200 de degrees, uh, you may be kicking one of the surgeons against the wall or something. And uh, this is not very advisable. So typically, the scans take between 20 to 5 seconds for the rotation. And this is way too slow to actually reconstruct the heart. And we will look into some approaches how we can still reconstruct the heart using ECG triggering. Then we will also look into motion deformation for reconstruction and also into ECG-guided motion detection. So if you know you're imaging the heart and it has a certain pace, then you can actually use that information to detect what parts of the volume must contain the heart and which parts are not uh, moving at the same frequency at the heart. And then those voxels must be some kind of background tissue. Okay, so what makes, medica uh, what makes interventional medical image processing so special? So we have... Uh, hands-on hardware lecture, so we will be very close to the hardware. And in fact, you need to know quite a bit about your hard hardware in order to do appropriate image processing for the hardware. Then we want to go into cutting-edge research results. So we will actually look at some papers that have been published very recently and uh, bring them directly to the lecture. This is also one of the reasons why we don't have a book, because we quite... Um, 
at points we change the contents of the lecture in order to be up to date with research. And we will base the chapters on recent publications. The topics are also of very high interest uh, for industry. So this is also something where we like to put focus on. So we don't just do research because we want to have interesting research, but we also look a lot into collaborations with industry. And a lot of the things are actually used in industry that you learn in this lecture. So it's a good preparation, not just for science, but also for a career in industry. It's an excellent preparation for a thesis projects. It's going to be difficult, but it's going to be tons of fun. We will have tons of fun. And you will see that it's really, we will look into really cool methods. And then you will think about it and say, oh, this is really cool. Maybe in, in five years, you will think about this lecture and say, oh, I think this is a problem where I can use a, a part of this method. And then this is also what we're aiming at. So you should not just memorize the contents, also for the preparation of the, of the written exam. Of course, there will be a, a bit of uh, looking at the theory and reproduction. But what we are actually aiming at is that you learn how to think in a particular way and how to adopt methods to a specific problem. So generally, none of the methods that you will learn here exactly in this class can be employed directly to a problem. But you should be able to understand how you have to modify an algorithm to make it work for your problem. That's the point we're aiming at. And this is also what industry is interested in. Industry is not interested in deriving uh, tons of formula and then finding a mathematically exact and uh, very beautiful algorithm. What they want is they want a method that works. And in the interventional case, they want it to work in real time. So it has to be fast, accurate, robust, and it should, be, uh, it should work very well. And of course, we will select methods that also are mathematically quite nice. So they will always be a nice trick towards the algorithm. OK, so this is the introduction to the lecture. Do you have more questions? No more questions? No? Remarks? Yes? I have a question concerning the, um, the, the exam. Yes. Um, will we have to do some uh, pseudo coding or something like that in the exam, or is it just theoretical? It will mainly focus on theory. It will mainly focus on theory. I cannot imagine that there will be an exercise where you have to produce Python code. Because if it were so, then the exercises would be mandatory. So you can actually pass the exam only attending the lecture. Because you said um, a minute ago that the um, exercises help. Well, we will, we will have to put in there some, some tasks where we will have to calculate something. And we will also place, we will not only do coding exercises, but we will also do a, a couple of exercises where you can calculate something. And if you look closely at those exercises, you can probably already figure out how uh, the kind of task in the written exam would look like. But of course, not all of the written exam will be doing, doing calculations. Huh? So there will be also questions about theory. Uh, I don't think we will put multiple choice in there, but... Um, Maybe you have to, uh, to draw a figure from the script and explain something and do a short, uh, a short sketch of a proof. I mean, if you, if you attended one of our oral exams, uh, then you know how the, excess, uh, how the exams usually looked like. And we're trying to get something quite similar to that. Yeah. OK, good. So uh, who of you has attended DMIP already? And who of you has not? This is interesting. It's always 50%. <laughs> Every semester, it's 50%. Does, it doesn't fit your schedule? Or how, how come that uh, you start with IMIP? Ah, you're studying your master course in summer. Ah, yeah. 
Excellent. Why are you studying your master's course in summer? Okay, I can. <laughs> because the master thesis will be in winter. Uh huh. Well, if you start if you start in summer, it's it's probably in winter. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So interesting. So you, did you study here in Erlangen previously? Oh, I have another interesting question. So who of you? Uh, uh, so what are you studying? So who is studying medical engineering? Okay, who is not studying medical engineering? Okay, so you do computer science. Computer science? Com who's studying computer science? Wow, this many computer scientists. And then who's studying computational engineering? Okay, and wh what are you studying? Ma mathematics. Mathematics? <laughs> so this is a very applied topic for you guys. Well, it's, a, it's a minor subject. It's a minor subject, I see. Okay, so what else did I miss? Who, who is studying CME? What are you guys studying? MOT. Okay. Okay. MOT. What else did I miss? Who's studying CME? Nobody. Okay. So we so we have computational engineering, um, MAOT, mathematics. Why did you guys came up here? If you do map. I, I, this is perfectly fine, by the way. <laughs> so, and, and, and you're a my, minority, so I don't want to... Uh, people write in the evaluation form, he was discriminating against uh, mathematicians. No, no, I'm not, actually. This is, this is very cool, actually, that we have uh, mathematicians coming here. Okay, cool. Um, so we have... Oh, my God. So we only have 35 minutes left. So this is pretty, it's going to be pretty harsh to do SVD in 35 minutes. <coughs> so who has not heard uh, something about SVD in DMIP before? Single value decomposition? You guys? Who has heard about single value decomposition before? Okay, everybody. Who wants to hear a refresher on single value decomposition? Okay, it's so only, only a very f small fraction of the audience. So in this case, um, I would propose that we do the refresher on singular value decomposition on April 19th. Okay? So if you are already aware of how to do singular value decomposition, then you can skip the lecture on April 19th. And the next lecture will be probably April 21st. Okay? Any more questions? No more questions. Anything else that we need to discuss? The slides are not yet on the website because, uh, website because I didn't copy them to Leonard. Uh, but they will be on the website tomorrow. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so the, the SVD slides will be there because I, I reworked them today. And also this set of slides will be there. And the next set of slides I think I want to work on before I actually show you the current state. Yes, I will try to do so. Yes. Yeah. The start of the semester hit me by surprise. <laughs> Who could imagine that the semester already starts? Okay. <laughs> Any other remarks? Okay, so in that case, um, we will finish for... The yes, yes. Exercises start on April 18th. Uh, wait. Wait, let me, let me... This is next week. In the week of April 18th. So next week, start the exercises and also registration and so on starts next week. So you can see the details on the website. And there is no more lecture this week. And the next lecture on singular value decomposition will be on April 19th. And if you already know about singular value decomposition, 
you can skip it. <laughs> okay, then, yes, yes? How many hours? Well, well, you don't even have to attend the lecture because it will be recorded. If you want to do the exercises, I would recommend to spend 45 minutes in the exercises. And then, of course, you have to complete the task. But um, it shouldn't be too hard to complete the exercise tasks. Other than that, um, you can look through the slides before the lecture if I upload it in time. Otherwise, you can look at the slides after the lecture. <laughs> and of course, you can take notes. Um, yeah, but other than that, I think... So most of the preparation time will probably go um, into, into this when you do the written exam. But if you attend here, um, or if you can't make it, you can watch the video, and things should be fine. Yeah, so there's, you just have to show it to your tutor. So you have to complete 50% of the exercise tasks. At the end of the semester or forever? Well, prior to the written exam, I would recommend. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but uh, I think you can ask the tutors. But, um, yeah, it, it shouldn't be too harsh with the exercises. I think if we, if we want to have corrections, uh, for example, on, on some written exercise that you submit, then there will be a deadline, of course, because then we won't be able to correct them. But for the programming task, you need to implement it and actually show that the implementation works. Yeah. This is, and exercise groups will be pretty small, or should be pretty small, that you have really interaction with the tutors. Anything else? I'm already overextending this lecture, so uh, see you next week. <laughs>